introduce uh, Dr. Samuel Lang Sam as the uh, people should be called. And uh, he is a patient and head surgeon surgeon practicing in Dallas, Texas in USA for many years. Currently the Vice President of American Board of Head Surgeon Surgery. He is a senior fellow of International Society of Head Surgeon Surgery. He is a also an author of 10 textbooks of which 6 are on head transplantation level. He is a director of Saint Louis Head Transplant 360 workshop and if you have the brochure right in front of you, those who want to attend can definitely contact him. I present Dr. Samuel Lamy and he is going to give a golden tip of oration on eyebrow restoration. Thank you so much. Um, this is a painting I did of myself, so I decided to use that instead of a photograph. So I'm going to talk about eyebrow hair transplant. It is a very advanced topic, and it's one of those things that I have a lot of beginners come to me and say, I want to start learning hair transplant. Can I start doing eyebrows? And I say, this is the last thing you should learn. It's the last thing you should do because it's so easy to make mistakes and make it look bad. And you have to have the best staff to help you, otherwise your results will look bad. As you know, there's been a trend toward thicker eyebrows, and I think that's why you see an increased demand um, in all your celebrities wanting thicker eyebrows. And so there are many things. Function is one of them, sweat coming down, it has a protection. There are certain cultures in which shaving the eyebrows may uh, be a certain ritual. As you know, that there can be a humanness lost when there is a loss of the eyebrows. And it also uh, talks about youthfulness and gender as well. So the indications would be in the past over plucking where the hairs don't grow back. You want to cover a bad tattoo that looks unnatural. Congenital reasons that are just born that way, traumatic hair loss, and of course hypothyroidism. <clears throat> I heard just recently here that India does not have a high FFA uh, prevalence. We do in the United States. We need to really make sure that we make that differential diagnosis and, if there, and have a low threshold toward biopsy. So the restoration options, you have to give your patients options. Nowadays, instead of the tattoos that look very unnatural, they have microblading techniques that could be a good alternative for them. And so when you do a transplant, there's so many things in, in, you have to keep in mind in terms of artistry, gender, ethnicity, facial, taste, etc. And so when you look at an eyebrow transplant, it typically if you are skilled, it takes a few hours in the morning, by early afternoon you're done. Graphs uh, per side are between 400 to 600. Um, and if you're starting out, it could be a lower count, we'll talk about that. And then obviously a few days of recovery time where there could be swelling around the eyes, and then a few months to regrow. The design principle here, from a microscopic perspective, there's this fanny approach that on the head that becomes this fishtail everyone knows about, and then it, and it goes over to the side where it, 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 ta it tapers off. You could look at the medial portion being at the uh, lateral uh, canthus, the uh, peak for females being at the lateral limbus, uh, arching up from the point of the, the ala, and then um, the point of the lateral terminus being through the lateral canthus, starting again from that nasal ala. But all those principles aside, what has worked for me in my practice is I have my patients design it themselves first. Because, and during the consultation, because otherwise you're sitting there drawing it for 20 minutes and then they say, that's not what I want. Let them design it first, they'll save you time. And then if it looks really off, you can give them input of what maybe looks better. And you wanna do that during your consultation. They can even draw it in before they get, get to your office. So that way it saves you some time. And then I just reinforce that area with a permanent marker. So considerations, you know, you remember that donor dominance, we had, I had a talk earlier this morning about that, and the concept behind that is that, you know, the, the hairs potentially grow as fast, and they may never slow down. They may act like, a, like the, the scalp, and you cannot uh, uh, base your results on recipient dominance. So donor harvesting, there's linear strip harvesting, or FUE, we'll talk about both of those. For me, I don't like non-shaved approaches, so I look at FUE as someone with a short hairstyle that you're worried about a linear scar. If they've not got the suitable hair in the, in the exact region, then I will be doing FUE. Uh, women and, and, F, and long hairs, I just think FUT or linear strip is best. Uh, these are the t uh, tools that I use for FUE. And then we're gonna talk about how to do FUE donor anesthesia. 
So for me, I start with just putting a few punctate uh, injections along the occipital nerve. It's very hard to identify exactly where the nerve is, but I just put a few uh, drops. That allows me to put the FUE donor tumescence in. And um, I'm gonna have this on YouTube, but you're welcome to take a photograph of this uh, formulation. And this, obviously, most, you don't need 250 milliliters of saline for the donor if you're just doing an eyebrow. But it is good because I spread out that area so that there is less risk of seeing dots on the back when I'm doing an a eyebrow transplant. So I do harvest from a wide area. And you can just do some uh, calculations, for example, just reducing the amount. Uh, and I really think this dilute bupivacaine holds long enough for both standard FUE as well as FUE for uh, eyebrow transplantation. So from these initial punctate points, I use a 25 gauge needle and I go straight through that area that's already been anesthetized with standard lidocaine dosing and I just bleb it up. So I just go along this occipital nerve and continue to expand it. Then I go down, I go uh, across and then laterally. And so this is a, a schematic. I put those little entry points, and then I begin the FUE uh, donor tumescence. I really believe this is the key. It is a field block. It allows me to get the best anesthesia. I just progress around those occipital nerves, expanding upwards and eventually outwards from there. So I would encourage you, if you do harvest for eyebrow uh, Transplants don't harvest from mini strips, don't harvest from a small area, don't you do a little window shave, harvest from a wide area because if the whole point is they want to wear their hair short or maybe eventually shave their head, you want to minimize the risk of having exposed dots. So a wide harvest zone is important. Uh, to do linear strip or FUT, I believe that the ring block is the key and then tumescence just to minimize transection during the harvesting. So you can do these, um, they're under minimal sedation. I just put little drops again with these uh, 30 or 32 gauge needle of just 1% lidocaine to 100,000. Uh, I like to use 4% septicane or articane to join these areas. Um, it provides profound anesthesia and you don't need very much dose for that. And the tumescence preparation is identical to what you saw, except I don't think you need to be bupivacaine dilute bupivacaine because all I do is I go back and add a high concentration of bupivacaine along the linear incision at the end of the procedure. So it's the exact same thing you saw. All I do is I just take out the dilute bupivacaine component. So tumescence, I use a 21 gauge instead of a 25 gauge uh, and just sort of in that subcutaneous plane, blow it up as, as much as I can. Then I come back along my proposed incision and I go almost intradermal or very superficial subcutaneous and further to mess that. That way, where my harvest is, I have that much less chance of transection during a, a linear harvest. So we'll next talk about recipient site anesthesia and creation. You need to know the anatomy. So the way that the nerves are distributed is you've got the superorbital bundle medially, and then you've got the, uh, the lacrimal gland laterally. But to really knock out your lacrimal gland, is not so easy. So it's to me, it's a regional block, meaning in other words, I'm hitting a nerve, and then a direct block, which means I'm hitting along the, the, the pattern. So what I do is I inject straight into the um, super ruler that blocks out the medial half, and then I go across the actual expanse of the eyebrows, going within it and going outside of it so that I don't smear my lines. And as I said before, I really like um, this 4% uh, articane is the generic name. I use dental carpules, and then a trick here is I push up the dental carpule until that, that little cap is almost out, and then I take it out. That way you don't have the, the air pocket, that's, you can't draw against it. And I just draw one milliliter syringes of this, 4% to 100,000. Um, the reason I like it, 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 you don't need very much anesthesia, anesthetic load, and it provides profound anesthesia over about three or four hours. It's easy to touch up if you need to. So this is just an example. I think everyone knows how to do a super, super orbital block. Um, I don't need to go into that. And then it's just showing you that I inject outside the line, inside the line, until they're fully anesthetized in that area going along. Um, during the procedure, you want to provide some eye coverage or protection so they don't have so much, so much illumination in their eyes. I just prefer a curl X bandage wrapped around, and also if I'm doing a linear harvest on the back, it sort of helps uh, uh, soak up any, any of the uh, heme on the back side. Or you could do a folded um, 
Uh, eye ma uh, face mask, of course, right now with the coronavirus, you probably don't want to waste one of these for this, but you put that with some padding underneath, like some four by four gauze folded. It's a way to sort of uh, uh, mitigate some, some oozing into the eye, eye area and also provide some illumination uh, coverage. So what, how, how have I evolved my technique? This is the core of the talk right now. So I started using perpendicular sites also known as coronal, but as you know, that's a misnomer in this situation. Perpendicular sites, I, I, I migrated, and I'll tell you why, uh, in a moment, to parallel sites that were um, two hairs in the center and one hair in the perimeter, which I got very good results on. And now, for the most part, I use parallel sites using almost exclusively one hair graphs, with some exceptions. So why don't I like perpendicular sites? Of course, there is this idea that perpendicular sites or lateral slits provides you an ability to not let the graphs go up. Because if you have high tilted graphs, they don't look natural. So let's talk about that. So if you think about if the perpendicular sides are placed, this is a side cross section. Let's just picture this being the top of the head. If you look at a side cross section, and it's, it, you can make them like this, and you don't get the, the sides joining one another. However, let's look at this. This is a frontal view. So I've changed the view, frontal cross section. If I'm making parallel sites in the eyebrow, and they're very low, very low angle, they all compete underneath the skin surface. And so when I make perpendicular sites, I can't get them tight enough. Does that make sense? This is a very critical point. So of course, if you do parallel sites, there are some risks, and I'm gonna to talk to you about how to avoid them. But for me, I can't dense pack my eyebrows sufficiently with perpendicular sites, if that makes logical sense, because the sites are too low angled. The other reason is simply I can see my design and my, my staff can see the design because they can see the flow with parallel sites. So this is another reason I advocate it. And along those lines is a similar topic is that I don't join my sites together as much because, I, they, because they don't compete for the same space because that angle is so absolutely low. And I'll talk to you in a minute about how to achieve those low angles. So this is an example when I was making perpendicular sites, I can't see my pattern. My staff can't see which way they flow and they're not that dense. Now that I'm doing parallel sites, you can see the angulations and direction and you can see uh, I can make it much denser. Of course, always start, whether it's FUE or linear strip harvesting, make sure you test that graph length so that you don't go and make all these sites and nothing fits. So always test a couple sites first. So what is the problem with parallel sites? Of course, this is the reason a lot of you say don't do it because you can't get them low enough, right? It's going to look weird. And I would agree with you. If you are not comfortable making your sites flush with the skin, your angles will look crazy, okay? So yes, they can still ride up a bit, but I've found that if you make your sites low enough, you're not going to have the situation where the hair stick out in a weird way. So how do I do it? Triple bend. Boy, that's confusing. What the heck are you talking about? When I try to teach this in St. Louis, people look at me with a glazed over look. So for beginners, I stopped teaching this. But I wanna show you in the next two to three slides what I mean by a triple bend, okay? Uh, the next one will be a little clearer. So look at this. A double bend allows me one bend, one bend like this. It allows me the graph length. It defines the graph length, right? If I'm bending a needle. But the third bend, which you're seeing on the lower image, allows me not to have to torque my hand all the way down so that I can keep my hand up and not have to try to angle it like this to keep the low angle. So that's why I like that triple bend. Here's another view, is you can see that how flat that sight is being made, but how high my hand angle is. I don't have to torque it like this, okay? Um, and this is, and then if you bend it, this is another esoteric, it is very advanced comment for beginners are gonna be even more thoroughly confused. You can bend it one way or the other. Why is that bend that I'm showing on the left better? Because when I'm looking at this, the, the bend is, the, the, is not blocking my eyes sight of eyesight, the line of sight as I look at it. Does that make sense? I know this is a bit esoteric, but hopefully you get it. I'm more than happy to answer the question after the talk. This is just showing you how I make these sites. This is a video, hopefully that will play. Oh, did not play. Did it play? No, it did not play. Uh, how do I go back? I can go back like this. How do, I, how do I go back on this? Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay, let me see. Can I just click on that to hit play? Uh, 
Okay, well. Oh, there it is, play. Good. Okay, well, I'm only showing the inside side. It's the same thing. But you see how I stop? I, I, there's a little where I, I just get uh, into the skin and I torque down and go in. So that little technique is important. Uh, so that way you don't sky the cross. It's very easy to slip and make your sight too large, especially when you're going to such a low angle. So I start from, oh, let me go back one. I apologize. How do I go back again? This thing is, here we go. Okay, perimeter tip. So I do that first. I draw the perimeter around first because that way I don't lose my line. I stagger the line like a hairline. You don't want to make a straight line. Um, and agree beforehand with the patient. Do you want it on this line or do you want it inside the line? Because that's a little subtlety that can be important. Um, do both sides. Check symmetry. Check the numbers. Make sure you're symmetric. The way you check it is take your, your magnifiers off and look. Okay? Then... Okay, I guess I showed this already, but it's good to see it again. This is just showing you how slow I am uh, in making those, and I make that touch, turn down, slide in, flat. So I think that's important. So from the uh, body, st I start from the head and go to the tail. Um, slight towing in before you go flat, I talked about that, and rotating the head is important. I'll show you what that means in a minute. And always check for symmetry without moves so you can see the big picture. So rotating the head is as you're progressing to the tail, the heat flat, I progressively turn the head so that I don't have to be cocked like this with my body position. I have moved, this is the biggest game changer for me in the last year and a half, is moving from two and a half to four and a half loops. This is the same loops that I use for FUE harvesting. My God, I can see better. Maybe because I'm old, I don't know. But yeah, I see so much better. Now I can dense pack. That's what has converted me from needing two hair grafts in the center to one hair graft because I'm now using four and a half X loops with a better focal distance um, for that. So my workhorse is a 22 gauge uh, needle and I move from 21 gauge. Of course, if your staff cannot place into it or if you cannot make the design appropriately, use the appropriate sites that your staff needs. So this is basically moving from uh, doing a one, when I was doing two and a half uh, uh, loops, I was using a perimeter of ones and then twos inside, and now I'm using mainly all ones, but not in every case. <clears throat> and I moved from a much higher graph, almost double the graph count now, but I'm not using two hair graphs, and I still got very natural results with two hairs. I just think that if I can dense pack one, I'm gonna get even better results, and I think I've seen that now. So I use platelet-rich plasma uh, and 100 milligrams of the uh, A-cell, no financial affiliations with any companies. I injected it um, right before graft placement. So these are the, the biocellular uh, techniques that I use. I truly believe these things from a liposomal ATP hypothermosol, all these things are huge for me to get better results. Graft placement is so under, understated here. If you are the most advanced surgeon and your staff cannot trim these grafts properly if they're doing a, a linear strip harvesting, follow the hair curl, follow that curl as it goes across, um, it, it, and trauma, not traumatize the grafts during insertion, or double stack them by accident, you're not gonna get the results. Absolutely, just not gonna get results. So you have to be not only the, the most advanced surgeon doing this, but you have to have the most advanced staff and the best staff doing this. And unlike how I make my sites from head to tail, they make it from tail to head so that they don't compete on their sites as they're placing. So graph placement really is so tricky. It is so important to do it well. So check, double check, check, double check, check. Let the patient see it. Always have spare grafts because the patients will always complain. Oh, I think this is here, I think I could, could do. And if you spend that extra hour renegotiating some of those details, the patients will be much happier than just finishing the procedure and being done with it. Microblading is now an alternative, and there are pros and cons. If you've got a great artist who can do this work, patients may prefer this. They may not want that some of the negatives of an eyebrow transplant, so what are they? This is a simple um, schematic here. So the difference here is that microblading is temporary for the most part. It's gone, whereas eyebrow hair transplants are permanent. They look like eyebrow hairs versus, because they're eyebrow hairs. They're three-dimensional, they're, they're hairs, but they both require artistry. So that, that is a difference, but the problem with this is if you, if you do not get recipient dominance, you're gonna to have to trim them every few days, and I'm gonna talk about how to do that more easily. Um, so there's more, potentially even more maintenance with eyebrow transplants, and I tell all my patients that, especially my male patients. Um, and you need to really 
think about these pros and cons and give your patients proper counsel as they're thinking about having it done. So I love these thinning shears. They, they look much better, they layer. Like if you have an advanced um, person that is cutting your hair, they may use thinning shears. I give my patients these thinning shears after an eyebrow transplant. I don't just say, go trim your eyebrows. I show them how, I have videos on YouTube that tell them, this is how you trim your eyebrows, so that they don't have confusion. I should, if they have a question, my staff knows how to show them if I don't. So the challenge is acute angles. My God, these have to be flat. This is not even 10 or 20 degrees. These are super flat. You know why? Because when you make it flat, they're still 10 to 20 degrees. You make it 10 to 20 degrees, they're 40 degrees. Um, I don't care if you make perpendicular or parallel sides. That, that you have to be an expert in making consistently low angles, flat to the surface. Small sides, fragile grafts. The hair curl has to be perfect. If your hair curls, if you know what that means, right? The hairs exit from the epidermis at a certain curl. If you do hair curls on your scalp slightly off, maybe it doesn't look that bad, but you really it's still unacceptable. When your, your hair curl is off on your eyebrow, it's totally screwed up. So this is so important. White hairs add another level of complexity that's even worse than if you're doing white hairs on the scalp. Coarse hairs, do they look natural? Ethnic hairs, African hairs. So some aftercare details that you may think about. I, just like for my, my scalp transplants, et cetera, I don't wash the hair for 24 hours and use a gentle sh uh, shampoo. I tell them not to rub against the direction of the transplanted hairs. Um, always dab, don't wipe. And I, again, no financial affiliation, but I love liposomal ATP. I think it's my best friend if you have it available in this country, I don't know. Um, I spray it every one or two hours. I tell them to spray it every one or two hours. Um, and then normal hair washing after a week. Um, if it starts to get scabby, I like to, you know, start putting a radioplex or, a, or an emollient onto their scabs. Uh, that way they don't scab too much and definitely obviously don't pick at the scabs. One pearl is I found that with linear strip harvesting to get better donor incisions, I like to leave my uh, sutures in for a minimum of 14 days. So I prefer 14, 15. If they can't take it out for 21 days, I think the results are even better. If you start taking it out, I used to take it out at day 10. First started day seven to day 10. I'm getting much better outcomes with much longer times of, of keep, keeping them in. Uh, this is a, a technique of just, if your hairs are not flat enough, flat enough, you can help guide them after the first uh, week from first two to three weeks with an ace wrap, just gently holding it down. And as the grafts start to come in at three to four months, I sometimes have them uh, do this as well. I don't really now need this because I think my sites are pretty good, but this is a, a, a trick that may be out there. So this is um, uh, traction loss and eyebrow loss. Of course, what you worry about is this, uh, is this CCCA, FFA? Is this something where you're missing? If, you have, if there's a question, please just biopsy it, it's much safer. And you can see there's a lady from out of town, I don't have a consistent after photograph, but she's elated because when you have eyebrows, it gives humanity back, it gives life and femininity and youth. And again, a combination of eyebrows and hairline. This is an over-tattooed look that just doesn't look natural, and now she looks natural. This is an over-plucked and tattoo combination that looks bizarre, and now she looks less like, I hate to say, Groucho Marx, if people know, know that reference. Coarse hairs, over plucked hairs, very hard to achieve natural results. This is definitely a case where you gotta be careful looking at two hair grafts. Using FUE for both a combination eyebrow and beard transplant. This is a cancer reconstruction, a lady that actually cried during a testimonial, and she didn't want thick eyebrows. This was done many years ago when that was not in vogue. She just didn't like the fact that she felt ostracized by the world and she wanted to look normal. And so just putting a few grafts there made a big difference. And these are just disasters. People came to me, this is actually the, the four, is already after she plucked out all the mess. It was a, a local surgeon putting grafts using uh, a robotic technique, thinking, okay, you know, just because I've got it, I, I can do it. It's not the case. This is so hard. And so her angles are all messed up, so this is a reconstruction. And pretty good survival after one transplant um, through thick scar tissue in this area. A reconstructive procedure for a gentleman that also failed eyebrow transplant by someone that doesn't even do hair. And the grafts were all over the place. They looked horrible, had to take all of those out. So if you, if you get in a situation where the grafts look bad, take them out. Don't try to fight against them. Get rid of them. Electrolysis, plucking, laser, whatever it is, get rid of the grafts and start from the scratch. 
Traumatic case, bad uh, tattoo looks off, need to fix that by doing a, a transplant. And the, and the tape is very good in SCAR, if done, I think, with some of these good technique and regenerative medicines. This is a case report that I'll be presenting in the forum. Um, this is a lady that had a, a, a bad tattoo, and then she tried to do her own self-inflicted uh, chemical treatment, and she started getting a keloid. She presented to me with these frank keloids. So I did a combination of fifluorouracil and dilute triamcinolone until I got it flat. It took me several rounds to get there. I did the case um, with uh, African American hair. Sometimes those hairs are very splayed. It's very hard to pack in one hair, so I used two hairs. I did a FUT or linear strip harvesting, and the reason I felt comfortable is two reasons. Number one is that the um, area that I har uh, her she has um, uh, earrings on, so I know that she did it in keloid. Uh, number two is that this is self-inflicted. It sits outside of a normal keloid area. Keloids typically occur at the perimeter of the forehead going back to the occiput and from the lateral face out. I do a ton of keloid excisions, probably one a week. Major devastating occipital nuchal uh, keloids I remove. So I have a very good understanding of keloids. So I will tell you that um, I knew this was atypical, so I treated it atypically. Well, at one day she was happy, you can see, six months. Not so happy, why? Overall, pretty good result, but there's these areas that uh, regrew that really made me upset. All of a sudden, some of the keloids came back, so I put her through three rounds of this to get, get it down, and now she was like, I'm still not, dis I'm still not happy with this. What can you do, because I still, I, I still see these little holes. So then I thought to myself, okay, what should I do now? Should I go and just put more grafts in? I thought, okay, we could, but then what will happen is she'll have potentially keloids come back again. So I decided I'm gonna cut it out. And I've been using 7-O um, uh, Vicryl, uh, polygalactic, not some, polygalactin or something, I don't know the generic, Vicryl by uh, Ethicon, great thing for keloids. It doesn't sound like it makes sense that you want a non-absorbable, but for fine areas I use it, for large areas I'll use like a 3 -O polypropylene, um, but in these areas, I leave it in there. And she healed well, she was ecstatic with the results. There's still a small gap, but she's just really happy. So the lesson I learned in this case report is I should have just cut it out. I should have cut out the abnormal keloid tissue, done the transplantation, I believe that I would have gotten a better result and not had to go and, and do more injections afterwards, et cetera. So uh, before and after, this is the series, uh, before, after surgery, after final surgical excision. And so, Daniva, uh, Shubhya, and I would say, think like an artist. This is fun. The reason I have a passion for this world of, of hair restoration is that it is design. It is beauty. It is design. And, and, and you don't know what you can do until you start. Two months ago, I started doing portrait. You saw the first one. That was of me. This is my little child, little baby. And I just started, oh, man, I could actually draw. I can actually paint. I never do that. Until you start to challenge yourself, you don't know what you can do. I invite you to Panama. Uh, I invite you to join the uh, American Board of Hair Restoration Surgery. And I invite you to come to St. Louis uh, for the workshop uh, July 24th to 25th. Thank you very much.